This is going to be a relatively long camping story, told by somebody who doesn't speak English as a native language. So please, be understanding. Romania is a country where people might get kidnapped, murdered, disappear and such. So yeah, my parents were legitimately afraid for me and were very against the idea. I had to lie to them and say that we would stay in a hotel near a national park just so they would get off my back. Obviously, that is not what we did. So, long story short, we had to travel from around this area to this park, which was around 200 kilometers in a two-hour train ride. We got our immense backpacks, everything we needed, and went on our way. Nothing specifically happened in the train, except for the fact the train was overly crowded, with the exception of our train compartment being completely empty. That is extremely rare for Romanian trains. I got excited, thinking that we had that whole compartment all to ourselves. As I said, it is a very rare thing to happen. Of course, after 10 to 20 minutes goes by, it got occupied by a man entering our compartment, accompanied by a beautiful German shepherd. I love all kinds of animals, cats and dogs in particular. I usually find my way around to all animals, even those the people I don't like. Not this dog, though. This dog was otherworldly. He looked so stuffed, as if it was a stuffed animal. He would listen to his owner's every single command. I was impressed by it, so obviously. I start asking the man about his dog, since it would be a long and awkward trip to do in complete silence. The man was exactly like his dog, except the commands he would give to his dog. No other contribution to the conversation. He told me the dog's name, which in Romanian means the killer. It's a very weird name to give to a dog, because, for this example, we would use the English word as it is, not translate to the word Romanian the name of the dog like that. But I thought to each their own. I asked him, why such a scary name? And he bluntly replied, this dog is trained to kill. It's the only thing he likes, and the only thing he is truly good at. Personally, I consider that the dog will grow up to have a very similar personality to his owner. And most times, I would judge people with dogs on how that animal reacts to the world and to his or her owner. And let me tell you guys, these two did not give a good vibe. I brushed everything over, thinking to myself that maybe this guy is training his dog to hunt. Then, I started thinking which woods are legal to even hunt in our country. While I was thinking that, the guy, out of nowhere, asks us if we are traveling to the same national park. That was surprisingly accurate, considering that the only time we mentioned the place was in the train station, long before we ever found our seats, and way longer before we ever met this man. Again, I thought it was nothing, because in my country... People who happen to go in the same direction will try and make small talk. Guess where you are heading. Of course, you can just lie to keep safe of your destination, or be honest. I took the honesty route, and I am judging myself for that. Never be too honest with strangers, or honest at all after you read the story. We confirmed we are going to that place, asked what else is to see around, since he began talking about the area, and, well, considering we knew nothing about the place, we took it all in. He told us about the woods, the vegetation, the animals, the all we can encounter. Told us about a beautiful monastery, right at the bottom base of the mountain that we need to climb. Advised us to visit the Low Tree Shore waterfall, and explore the caves behind it, to try out the local restaurant. When this guy began talking about the wilderness and nature, his eyes glowed, 
as if he was experiencing a pleasant memory. But he also grabbed his dog's collar from the neck, squeezing it tight. The collar made a loud clink. What surprised me was the dog made no move. No whimper, no twitch, nothing. Just like a stuffed animal. Anyway, we reached our destination, said our pleasant goodbyes. The man waves at us, and we faced against him to go on our way. I turn around, back right away, because I wanted to ask where exactly that restaurant was. The man and dog were no longer there. Not just that, but his luggage was also gone. That creeped me out a bit, but who cares? We were too thrilled for our first camping experience. We start walking with our backpacks on us, 10 kilograms each, and reach a tunnel digging into the mountain. It looked amazing, exactly like those horror movie tunnels which, if traveled during night, would make your hair stand straight. Lucky for me, we traveled during a daytime. It wasn't a long tunnel. We could see the end by the time we got to the middle of it, and we hear a whimper in the distance. It sounded like a dog, crying in desperation. We stop. My boyfriend looks at me with his, oh no, you're not going to take that dog with us type of face, tries to convince me to take a different route entirely. We don't. I hear the dog. I go right towards the sound. And in the middle of the road, I see a chubby puppy with lots of white and brown circles on his butt crying so hard and laying on the cement, looking hurt, as if hit by a car. I freeze and think to myself that our trip is now over. I have to save this dog. We call for him. He looks at us, pointy ears up, gets up and like a doofus, starts running desperately to us. He was alone and afraid. We called him Rudolph, and now he was our camping buddy. Like one kilometer further, we find another puppy, probably his sister, which we dragged from the nearby river. Someone had threw her in the river to kill her, wet, cold, and hungry. Of course we took her too. So here we are. Ten kilogram backpacks each. Two puppies at my chest. Boyfriend with the map. Trying to find a spot to camp the first night. We pass by the monastery the man in the train had mentioned. But because we had these puppies, we could not enter in the building. The priests would not allow it. So we just walked around the property through the gardens until we reached the base of the mountain we had to climb. I'd like to mention that these puppies were two tiny little brats because the second you put them down and forced them to walk on their own, they would slam down on the ground. We walk and walk and walk until we decide to stop because it was beginning to get late and I was starting to get cold. We found a spot next to a small landmark type cottage right in the middle of the woods. We called it Troyanitsa. It's like a scouting post, but for the church, where they place religious icons or a Bible, stuff like that, inside to bring good energy to the area. It belongs to the church. It wasn't like a house. Basically a roof with four small walls and an opening, not a door. You could go in, hide from the rain. There was an icon inside, and a Bible with pages ripped from it. Curious as I am, I opened the Bible, really annoyed to see that people would write down their names in it, like couples do on the tree. But one particular page, the words, I will find you, stuck out. It was written in red ink. Again, I thought to myself that it was probably somebody who wanted to scare travelers with silly messages. I put the book back and gave it no second thought. We put up the tent, make the fire, unpack, make food and eat. We feed puppies which are now cuddled up in our tent. And finally, darkness starts to rise all around us. 
my boyfriend always kept the fire up every hour because when it went off, it felt as if all the sounds in the woods were louder and closer to us than in reality. Now it's around 12 a.m. We are all in the tent, cuddling to keep warm. The puppies wake up and start crying. I get up, unzip the tent, and put them out to pee. They do, and I get them back in. They cry some more, and the smallest one begins shivering. At the same time, I hear grunting from behind our tent. My boyfriend is up too. He hears it as well. The fire is fading. The moment he unzips the tent and steps out, the sound disappears into the woods. It sounded like a snake slithering through the fallen leaves on the ground, but with unimaginable speed. I ask him, was that a snake? He says, up to this day, he cannot explain what he saw. He says it was a slithery figure with feet that made a sort of snort sound, like when the light hit it. The puppies calm back down after this creature ran into the woods. We try to go back to sleep after we reignite the fire. It's now 3 a.m. This time we wake up the puppies being fussy again. The fire is nearly dead, and we clearly have no idea to put up a sustaining fire. My boyfriend gets up to search for firewood, and I get out as well. I stare into the darkness, and I swear, I hear whispers coming from between the trees. I look up at the sky, considering it's only 3 a.m., and hear birds being very loud, flooding their wings. I'm no expert in birds, but don't they usually sleep around this time? Well, these weren't. They were very active, vocal, and very frustrated. I look at the fire, follow the red sparks popping out of it into the sky, and become fascinated with something. The spark doesn't seem to die. It goes on and on, changing color from a hellish red to green. This was very out of the ordinary for me. It created an illusion hard to explain. It looked as if the fire sparks were going into the woods, creating a track for me, probably, but to follow. I kept looking after each spark to see when it burns out. None of them did. They would levitate, turn green, and flow into the woods. At that moment, I began to get goosebumps on my skin. The birds being agitated, the mysterious light pointing us to go deeper in the woods, and all the trees around us has eyes on them. Like the trunks had a distinguished shape that looked exactly like eyes. I know this is nothing paranormal, since somebody explained that those shapes from when a branch is ripped from the root, and that's the shape that is left after. But, uh, there were so many, like a hundred eyes, all looking at the exact spot we decided to camp, having only that religious tiny landmark to mentally protect us. And as I inspect my surroundings, I hear movement in one of the bushes in front of our tent, like... 10 meters away from us. Obviously, I stand my ground but don't go near it. Suddenly, a dark, bent-over silhouette comes out of it and, half inside the bush, half outside, stares at us. I called my boyfriend, and we're both like, what is that? A bear cub? A wolf? A pig? The creature shakes its head, the same way a dog does after a bath. And I hear a distinguished clink, like a dog collar. At this time, my boyfriend manages to light up the fire really big, which scares this animal to run back into the woods, through the bush from which it initially came out of. That calms us down, but not enough to ever close our eyes again during the night. Going back into the tent, my boyfriend falls asleep. The puppies are sound asleep, but not me. I keep the zipper on the tent open just a little, just enough to have my eye peek through it, 
right at the early mentioned bush. I think I spent a solid hour staring and falling asleep to that bush. All of a sudden, I hear a noise coming from that direction, and I immediately wake up my boyfriend, who is now peeking through the hole in complete darkness with me. What we see next still haunts me. From that exact same bush, we see a human head popping out, looking towards our tent. Note that our peeping hole was small enough to not make it look like you were being watched from the inside of the tent. This head is slowly coming out of the bush, skin white. We thought it was a ghost. After that, a shoulder, another shoulder, a full torso, a leg. Bit by bit, an entire man emerges from the bush, completely naked, lighted both by the moon and our fire. What he did next was excruciatingly scary. He comes so close to our tent and begins to remove branches, rocks, etc. from our fire, basically extinguishing our fire by dismantling it. This is all happening like two to three meters away from our tent. I look at the man with horror because I recognized him. And now the clink I heard earlier from the animal is explained. It is the same man from the train, with his dog. I don't know if he followed us. I don't know if he just went the same route as us, and found us, and decided to stalk us. But this guy was there with us since 12 a.m. at least, because our fire would be dead every two to three hours, and we would be woken up by the sound of branches being cracked, rocks being moved, which we internally explained as animals crossing. After he successfully managed to put out our fire, he slowly crept back into the same bush, submerging into it bit by bit, until only his head would be out, with a very disfigured-looking mouth. Yuri tried to go back to sleep after that. We didn't know what to do, so we just got back out, reignited the fire, lit ourselves some torches, and stayed near the campfire until the first rays of sun came up. I admit that I did fall asleep while sitting down next to the fire, and so did my boyfriend, but any sound would wake us up. I was too afraid to go near that distance bush. I did not need any answers, any explanations. I just wanted a daylight to get out of there, and we did. We packed our stuff and we got out. We planned a four-day camping trip, and this experience made us give up after that first night. It was a risk we did not intend to take. If that thing followed us, or it was just a coincidence, it was more than enough. As a conclusion to my story, and advice to any first-time campers out there, never tell your location, or even areas close to your destination, to strangers. Anyway, stay safe. Always be aware of your surroundings, and any changes that come to you under the form of sounds, movements, changes of temperature, and so on. In my younger days, I used to go backpacking a lot out in the wilderness, specifically this time, out in the wilderness of Idaho, up in the mountains, where, on several different occasions, I experienced things that I can't quite explain. The first is coming into areas mainly near streams and small creeks, where there was absolute silence. Well, the only thing you could hear was the water running on the streams. But it's as if the sound of nature, birds, squirrels, the life of the forest had died out completely once stepping foot into the general area, which I always thought was very unusual, and always gave me the creeps. There were some points I remember my entire body's hair standing up at end, like that moment right before a car crash, or something intense is about to happen. I remember feeling like something could happen to me at any given moment, being on edge, bracing for the inevitable, but nothing ever did. I always thought it to be maybe a mountain lion was nearby, or maybe I was being stalked, but that never was the case. I never really saw exactly what was causing those feelings, 
The second time was when I was exploring the same mountains, probably three to four months later, later on in early fall. The first happened in late spring. I encountered a small cave, small in entrance, and I don't know how far deep down it went into. Me, used to spelunking a lot when I was even younger, got curious, and although I didn't have any spelunking gear, decided to get down into it a little bit and check it out. I only went down a little bit, but it had a very strange smell, a stink that I can't quite identify. It didn't smell like death or anything rotting, but it did have a very putrid smell. Not like garbage, but like a skunk. Maybe ten of them. It was really rancid smelling. An overpowering musty smell that I just can't quite put my finger on. I've told this story to a few of my hunter buddies who have much experience being out in the wilderness. They are the ones that mention this, not I. But we think it could possibly be a Bigfoot. I don't know. I don't believe in Bigfoot, so it's just a wild guess. And the third and final one is again in that same season, probably three to four weeks after finding that first cave. I was up on the slope, kind of a higher part of a ridge, when I heard the most strange talking, I guess we'll call it, about to my 12 o'clock, maybe 200 yards. It sounded like Chinese, but really fast, almost indigenous, if that's making any sense. It was really fast talking, almost like backwards, and sounded more like chattering than it did actually somebody speaking the language. Keep in mind it did not actually sound like Chinese. I'm just trying to think of something to accurately describe what I heard. Then, off to my right, probably to my four o'clock, I heard what I guess you would call a response conversation. The same noise, but a little bit lighter, coming to maybe about a hundred yards. I'm no hunter, but I do feel fairly knowledgeable about my experience in the outdoors and my knowledge of animal noises. I can't say for certain what animal I was hearing, but it did not sound like any animal I have ever heard in the wilderness before. Never one that makes a noise like that. And it had to be some sort of animal with intellect and being in a group, considering there was obvious a response and a call that I had heard. At least I'm pretty sure that was the case. I don't know. You know, I didn't used to believe in the whole Bigfoot idea, but the more and more I think and write this story out, the more it brings me back, and I'm kind of forced to reflect on the events that took place. Maybe a Bigfoot in the mountains and wilderness of Idaho is probably more of a reality now more than ever. I don't know if this exactly counts as creepy, but back many years ago, when I was still in high school, my friends and I liked to go back to this secluded area in the woods nearby and smoke cigarettes, sometimes sneak a beer, and joke around. You know, stuff that 17-year-olds do when they think they're cool. Well, a little bit about these woods. There was a lot of homeless. Sometimes, well, many times, the areas we would go to there would often be old homeless camps or old homeless tents with dirty clothes and other trash and belongings all strewn about, clearly abandoned. Nobody was going back there. It looked as if who had ever been camping out there, which we presumed to be homeless, had just left, left all of it. Clothes, miscellaneous belongings, everything. So it never really bothered us. Considering we had been going to this spot for months, and we had never seen a soul. Now, this forested area, or the spot that we would go to, it was the same spot we had been going to, even though there were several spots in these woods. This one particular spot was a hot spot for us, mainly just because we enjoyed it. We were secluded and enclosed in the trees. Far enough back, we didn't have to worry about anybody coming to ruin our fun or catch us since we were all really paranoid about being caught with cigarettes. Our parents were strictly Catholic, so if we got caught, we would have pretty severe punishments. Anyway, one day, I want to say it was spring, maybe May, if I'm guessing right. 
It was right before our graduation. I was a senior, and my other friends were also seniors and a couple of juniors. It was a group of us. The same spot where there was a bunch of homeless camps and tents and other miscellaneous trash and belongings strewn about. One day, we went back there, and all of that was mysteriously gone, just completely gone, as if in the last 24 hours, somebody had come in and taken it all down. Not only that, but there was no sign of any of it being there, and there was a considerable amount of old dirty clothes and trash, torn up tents. It would take a lot. But here's the creepy thing. In replacing all that stuff, or in the spot where all that stuff was, was a very awful smell. It's like if you took roadkill and threw it out in the hot summer sun for days on end. That terrible rotting death smell. You probably know what I'm talking about if you've ever smelt it. Around our spot, where all the clothes and camp stuff was, was a bunch of bloody animal skulls. I don't know if they were from a butcher or what. It wasn't like dogs or squirrels. Nothing like that. My guess would be like cow skulls or goat skulls. They were fully bloody and skinned. Nothing left. Just literally that. Bloody skulls with flies buzzing all around them. It's like a hunter when he kills the game and takes out everything. Well, my knowledge of hunting is very limited, so that's the only poor analogy I can give you. My friends and I counted at least 10 all around us. That means somebody came back here, took all the clothes, everything else, and replaced them with these bloody skulls in which were thrown on the ground. Flies were buzzing about, since it being spring it was warmer outside. It gave us the creeps, and we never went back to that spot. We found a different section of woods on the other side of the high school, and started going to that one instead. Now, I won't give the name of the high school I went to, but this section of woods was maybe, I don't know, a quarter of a mile, half a mile away at most, and we probably went in no more than two to three hundred yards in. Enough that you didn't have to actually hike back there, but enough to where you were fully secluded in the woods. I'd say no more than a five minute walk from the entrance to our spot, and I'm very confident that even though that used to be some sort of homeless encampment, we hadn't seen a soul for the multiple years we'd been going to that same area and spot to just hang out, talk, smoke cigarettes, and be kids. And while I do consider what happened to be very creepy, I just can't help but wonder why. Why would somebody go back there, clear all the tents and everything, which would be quite a bit of work, considering how many clothes and garbage and tents there were, and then replace it with a bunch of bloody animal skulls, which would require somebody dragging that in there and leaving it on the ground. It just doesn't make sense to me. Sure, like everybody else, I thought animal sacrifices, satanic cult or rituals, but even that doesn't make sense. Why would they get rid of all the homeless stuff, even if it had been abandoned and been sitting there for a long time? Even if I can't explain what truly happened, none of us can. It's still creepy and still makes for a good deep woods story. Not this last fall, but a few falls back. It was either 2018 or 2017. After my girlfriend and I had been dating for probably five, six, maybe seven months, somewhere around the half year mark, we decided it would be a great idea to have a big dinner at her parents' house. Her parents own a ton of land, far back, I want to say maybe 60 to 70 acres. I believe her dad hunts on it, but I'm not 100% sure. We ended up breaking up a year or two later, but that's beside the point. Everything went great. The dinner, hanging out, socializing. After dinner and dessert, we decided we'd take her dog and go on a nice little walk around her dad's property. This was the very first time I had ever visited it, so I was curious to kind of explore and just see around. Plus, it made for a good excuse to walk off my dinner that I had just gorged myself on. So, my girlfriend and I were walking, 
right along the tree line, since his property has a massive area that has no trees. A clearing, I guess you would call it. Or pastures. Whatever. It's not really forest. More just lightly packed trees. Not a lot of brush or anything. So we're walking, just in casual conversation. At the time, it is evening. Dusk. The sun is setting, so it's darker, but it's not completely dark yet. All of a sudden, her dog, who's not on a leash by the way, starts going crazy, and running after, he sees something in the woods. My girlfriend and I call out to her dog to come back, but he's very aggressive, ears back, growling, running after something. He runs off, past the trees, and we can't see where he went. We go running after him, thinking he probably just saw a deer, and him being so protective, did what he wanted to do. As we go in running after him, not even 10 seconds later of entering the tree line, her dog comes running back, full speed, tail between his legs, whimpering and shaking. As he's running towards my girlfriend, she kneels down to catch him and embrace him, and he runs right to her. I've never in my life seen a dog act like that. He was whimpering, practically crying. You know how you can see the expression on a dog's face. They do have facial muscles just like we do. The expression on this dog's face, paired with the noises he was making and his body language, was that of pure terror. Something really spooked this dog. This dog, by the way, wasn't no weenie dog. This was a bull mastiff. I believe that's what they're called. Spare me if I'm wrong in my dog terminology. I'll make it plain English for you. He was mostly pit bull with something else in him. Or so I believe. So, if you know anything about pit bulls, they're pretty lean and they have a lot of killing power. If that's what you want them to do. So, a big boy like him shouldn't be so frightened. But he was. My girlfriend and I, now feeling a sense of dread, kept looking back in the direction of where he ran from. We didn't see anything, so we just exchanged confused and concerned glances, not really sure what to do, all the while comforting her dog. Then we heard some movement, like something stepping on a twig, or the rustling of leaves that was far back. We both turned to look at the same time, and far back behind a tree, we could see this large black figure staring at us or peeking out through us at the trees. That's when I got the worst overwhelming feeling that we needed to leave now. If you've ever watched a horror movie, there's always a scene, and it never fails, where somebody is trapped in a house, a cave, a bad situation, I don't know, and you, the watcher, are just screaming, get out of there, get out of there, and they or it is coming for you and you know it, but the person in the movie doesn't quite know it yet. That is your gut instinct, screaming at you to stay alive and leave. That's what my girlfriend and I both felt. It really scared both of us. We didn't even say anything. At the same time, we just stood up, grabbed her dog, and quickly paced back to the house, maybe only muttering a few words. I'm not even sure what. Well, her father must have noticed that we were terrified, because the second we stepped back in the house with the dog, he just gave us a look and asked us what's wrong. Come to find out, her and I were both pale as sheets. We told him what we had saw, that there was something large back there, or somebody, staring at us. He immediately grew concerned, went and grabbed his gun, and went and looked for himself, was thinking there might be somebody sneaking on his property, possibly looking to case the house since her dad did run his own very successful business, had a lot of money, and had a very large house with a lot of property. He was also kind of surprised too, because they didn't have a whole lot of neighbors around, and the neighbors he did know, he knew very well. Only problem was, the nearest neighbor was a little over a mile away. They were tucked back there, deep in the neck of the woods. So, he went and checked out, came back about 30 minutes later, said he never saw anything, and whoever or whatever animal it must have been was now gone. 
I'm sorry this story wasn't more exciting, but I definitely believe me and my girlfriend at the time saw something that wasn't ordinary. Was it a person? I don't know. I don't believe in monsters and stuff. But if it was a person, then why did her dog come running like that? Why was it so scared? It just doesn't make any sense. I didn't smell anything, feel anything, other than seeing this large shape looking at us. I didn't see a face or any eyes, just a shape, a shape of a very large man, kind of doing a peeking motion from behind a tree a ways away. And it was dark enough outside, and the shape that was peeking its head out was dark enough that there was, again, no visible discernible details. My girlfriend at the time, who I talked to about it, agreed 100%, and saw and felt all the same things. This story that I'm about to share with you occurred all the way back in 2007, when I was visiting Yellowstone, along with some of my friends who were also interning there at the time, hence why I came to visit. A few of them got to go on to do search and rescue, while others, whom I believe just helped maintain peace and integrity in the park. And during my visit, my friends, whom I'll keep their names anonymous, were just beginning their internship. During the time, I really knew nothing about park rangers, other than them sitting in a tower or an office all day, or boringly patrolling around the entire park, looking for mischief, or maybe teenagers who weren't doing what they were supposed to. But little did I know that it would have everything and anything to do with things that go bump in the night, or things of a more supernatural nature. I wasn't exactly camping with my friends who were interning, even though they were there with me. They had job stuff to do, so much of it involved me actually just kind of camping out by myself while getting to hang out with them during the daytime, which was fine by me. I still had a lot of fun. But at nighttime, and keep in mind this wasn't my first camping experience, not only have I gone camping out in the woods by myself, but also in campgrounds with friends, family, and solo adventures, I have never experienced anything weird or out of the ordinary, so this whole thing was a first for me. On the very first night, I awoke to a strange light outside my tent. It was actually roughly 10 to 20 feet up in the air, right above my tent. I woke up and was very startled, thinking somebody was hanging a lantern or something. But after unzipping my tent and looking up, it appeared to be this bright orb, or what I can only describe, roughly the size of a tennis ball, just emanating a very soft, pale blue light. And just as soon as it appeared, it vanished, like somebody flicking the lights out. That definitely freaked me out. I ran back inside my tent and hid there as best I could from anything and really didn't get that great of sleep that night. But can you blame me? So the following day, I told my friends about it, the ones who had just started interning, and they both were quiet. They didn't say much about it. These were the same kind of guys who would mock me and make fun of me had I ever brought up aliens or UFOs or anything ghost-related. To have them be this quiet was very strange. But the day and the time did go on. So, as it did, the second night came. And this time, I was hoping I wouldn't see any strange balls of light. Now, at this time, I did not believe in UFOs, ghosts, or anything of that nature at all, actually. I don't know if I would have considered myself an atheist, probably more agnostic than anything. But the idea of aliens or UFOs just seemed so far-fetched, even though I couldn't exactly explain a tennis ball-sized orb of light directly above my tent the night before, I still wasn't about to admit to alien life. And, although I told my friends, they offered no input other than uncomfortable glances staring down at the ground, trying to avoid any sort of reply they could. This just weirded me out more than it made me feel uncomfortable. So, as I was saying, the second night came, and instead of any orbs of light, I was greeted with very strange sounds far off in the distance. It sounded like King Kong or some sort of crazy primate 
except the sounds were much, much deeper. Now, I know in Yellowstone, there are all sorts of wildlife throughout. I mean, this entire state is very popular for that. But this just sounded like nothing from what I could ever imagine hearing. There's nothing in the United States wilderness, to me, that resembles the sound of a gorilla, or any sort of primate whatsoever, especially ones with lungs that large, and a voice that deep. I wasn't sure what to make of it, but it only appeared here and there, not all throughout the night, but parts, very minimal, and only when I was awake. So nothing happened and startled me awake, thank goodness. The following day came and went, and I never discussed in any detail whatsoever about the previous night that occurred with my friends, the sounds that I heard, although strange and were a little alarming, wasn't a deal breaker for me to leave. I tried to suppress any feelings I had about these weird things happening, considering, well, you know, they're not exactly normal. The third night, I had a pretty good night of sleep. Actually, I slept better than I have in months, it felt like. I slept like a rock, probably for around 12 hours, to be exact. The following day, same thing. Friends hung out, we did stuff just like every other day, and on the fourth night, I slept again great. Now, it was the fifth and final day and night is when stuff got a little out of hand. See, right before I turned in for the evening, a gentleman from a few campsites over came to me and said, Hey, I don't mean to be alarming, but a little earlier, I saw a large bear, or what I thought to be a bear, walking upright, heading in your campsite's direction. I told him thank you, and I would closely be on the lookout. He walked away, and right then, I wasn't exactly sure if the Yellowstone even had grizzly bears in the area, but that he obviously had some sort of bear sighting, and I should keep my eyes peeled. Well, I never saw anything until it was time for bed. I feel it's also important, too, to make note that in Yellowstone, I was in the Madison campground, which I think is the most northern part of the campground site, and there was actually very few people in it during this week, probably because this was through a Monday and Friday, at least I can assume. There was a decent amount of people, but it was nowhere near full. In fact, I only had a few other people near my site, and by near, I mean several spots over, so I definitely had privacy, and at times during the night, this occurred to me every night, I would have to pee really bad, so I'd get up out of my tent, and instead of going to the bathrooms, I would run into the woods, which were close by, and do my business. At 2 o'clock in the morning, with nothing but a headlamp, it managed to work pretty good, because, well, you're surrounded in darkness, and nobody else around is looking for you, so it's nice. And that's exactly the perfect segue to take you into exactly what happened. I get up, on the very fifth night, probably one in the morning, and head over to the same trees that I've been going to every other night. But this time, as I'm approaching it, something felt off, and in my sleep stupor, I never once thought about the orb of light, or the weird gorilla noises I was hearing, or just how I managed to get the best night of sleep in my life the other few nights. And instead, I felt a very familiar feeling, like I was being watched from the woods, like the direction I was going to was dangerous. The bathrooms were easily double the distance in the opposite direction, which is why I went for the woods anyway. But I just said screw it, and kept going into the woods. I only went maybe 10 feet in, and at that point, I unzip myself, being very alert to the sounds and things around me. And even though I was still feeling watched, I couldn't exactly see a source of who was watching me. I did have my headlamp on, a one that just wraps around your head. I'm not talking about a full helmet headlamp. So I was looking around and couldn't see anything until I turned just enough to my right and I was met with a reflection of eyes on a very large dark shape. It almost appeared to be gorilla-like, but not quite. 
it was man-like as well. It's really hard to tell when you're in the forest because there's brush and trees in the way. But all I saw was the eye reflection attached to a large black silhouette, the shape of a gorilla or a man, but much, much bigger. I screamed, quickly zipped up midstream, and ran back to my tent as fast as I could. Unsure of what to do. Should I tell somebody? Should I try and protect myself? I wasn't sure. So I hid in my tent the rest of the night. Again, just like the first night with the orb, except this time way more terrified. Had I just seen a Bigfoot? I wasn't sure, but I had seen something. I didn't sleep at all that night either. And the morning came. I felt my adrenaline was really wearing low, and I felt exhausted. I feel like I had to call my trip quits, since this was the day I was planning on leaving anyway. I met up with my buddies, hopped up on at least three cups of coffee, just to try and endure my lack of sleep. I came clean and told them what I saw last night, and just like after the first night, they both went quiet, and then asked me if I could keep something on the down low. I agreed. They both pulled me aside, and they both told me that on their first couple days, they saw really weird things in the sky, orbs, triangles, strange shapes they can't identify, black, dark, huge humanoid silhouettes running through the woods, yellow glowing eyes, chasing them, running parallel, all sorts of super freaky fictionist stuff, except in their case, they were terrified when retelling it. And these dudes are dudes I went to high school with. Dudes who are super serious. Science diehards. The kind of guys who, as I told you earlier, would make fun of you if you ever said you knew or saw a ghost. These guys were absolutely scared, and I've never seen them so scared in my life. But, I asked them, is the job worth it? And they said yes, because it only happened a few times. But, obviously me bringing it up made them very uncomfortable, and almost served as a reminder to them that it's a very real part of their job. Now, if we fast forward now to 2020, both of them, to my knowledge, are still working as full-time park rangers. Although with COVID, I'm not exactly sure how that's worked out for much of the environmental field of work. Maybe they're not working there anymore. I think the one stayed with Yellowstone up until at least 2020. Again, I'm assuming COVID has put a dent in things. The other one I think eventually transferred or moved states. I'm not sure. Maybe to Pennsylvania or New York. Possibly Virginia. I lost contact with him. But as far as I know, he still works as a ranger. Because they both just enjoy the work, I guess. And even though there is weird things to the job, they love the sights. They love the sounds. And ultimately... They loved being immersed in nature 24-7 as a part of their occupation, even though sometimes that occupation has some very strange payoffs that you have to do. I guess the question here is, did they see the same thing I did? Because when they told me about their experiences, I didn't have much to say. I mean, conversation kind of just passed and changed subjects. But I think about it from time to time. And listening to your Bigfoot encounters and your park ranger stories always brings me back to that week. I wonder if I too saw a Sasquatch out there. I know nothing of the Bigfoot population in Yellowstone, or if that even is such a thing. And I also wonder, did my two friends see Bigfoots? I'm not exactly sure. I mean, for all I know, there could be a clan of them living out here. And maybe, just maybe, one was curious enough to sneak up on me that night to see what I was doing. When I said I was feeling watched, there wasn't a feeling of danger, like hostile behavior, or that I was going to die. Maybe, assuming how Bigfoots are, I was just being observed. When I shone my headlamp that night and saw the silhouette, it was probably somewhere 30 to 50 feet away, behind some trees and brush. This was June, after all, which is yet another reason I was so surprised that even though during the week... It was so empty compared to normal. Even my friends made that comment 
that they figured there'd be a lot more people, which, again, would also make sense that there wouldn't be as much activity or sightings. More people, less Bigfoot around, assuming that's what I saw. Anyway, I don't want to try and jumble all my words here. Please don't hesitate if you have any questions. I would love to get you answers as soon as I can. Back in the late 90s, for a brief period of time, I did a few search and rescue missions. That left me disturbed. It's not that I couldn't handle the job, or even pass the training. It was the result of two specific search and rescue missions that I'm going to tell you about. The first, being a young man who had just turned 21, decided to go out by himself during a blizzard up here in Colorado when he was strongly advised against it. We can't control people and tell them what not and what to do. We prefer to let people make their own judgment calls and wherever that leads them to is where it leads them to. Unfortunately, for this young man, it led to his death. He was reported missing, I want to say about 48 hours after he had gone. Nobody could find him. The conditions of his travel and disappearance were bittersweet, having a pro and a con. The good news is, the blizzard we had predicted did not hit the area in question to where we had a search or where his body had disappeared to. But the con was, is that he still disappeared, and finding his body would prove to be worse than we could imagine. After this young man was reported missing, we weren't quite sure if he was dead yet, which is why we went full on with our search. The search lasted nine whole days, when we finally caught trail of him, making it easier since the blizzard didn't hit the area, giving us more mobility and accessibility to areas beyond normal reach. The thing that struck us as very odd at first was that his scent ended on the trail that he said he was going down. Our dogs followed it to a specific point and then stopped as if the trail just suddenly stopped with it. I'm trying to think back and remember how exactly we found his body, which might be a little fuzzy in my memory, so forgive me for that. But the story goes, that at the end of the ninth day, we ended up finding him in not one piece, but pieces. He was found on a ledge about 1,200 feet higher up in elevation than the trail he was on. Virtually impossible for anybody to climb in those winter conditions, not even having the right equipment. We're talking about a 90 degree vertical wall covered in thick ice and other dangerous elements making it impossible to scale. His body was found at the very top, and here is where it gets gruesome. We found him in pieces, in a circular pattern. His chest was by itself. His waist was also by itself. His thighs, legs, and feet, forearms and arms and hands, all severed separately with perfect knife precision. The wounds were not cauterized. They were surgically and precisely cut. However, he was dismembered. It was done by somebody who knows what they were doing. Even the bone and joints were cut at very specific points, and each piece of his dismembered body was placed roughly 50 feet away from the other piece in one large circle, buried beneath about two feet of snow. The other piece we'll never quite figure out is we never found his skull or head. Every other piece of his body was there, without clothes, by the way. We have no idea what happened to any of his gear or clothing. His dismembered pieces were completely naked and left exposed to the temperatures. What it had appeared to be is his cause of death was somehow unknown. But after he had died, or presumed to have died, he was dismembered somehow, and then taken in pieces and laid in this circular pattern. It's very possible he might have died from hypothermia and threw off his clothes and then froze. 
but that still doesn't explain the dismemberment or how he managed to climb a 1200 foot cliff wall. If memory serves me correctly, the autopsy reports proved inconclusive to how in which he died, but personally, I'll never get over the manner in which he died and how he was found. That kind of stuff just sticks with you for a long time. The second search and rescue story that I wanted to tell you about happened with an older man who was 78 in great shape, mind you, very active, very fit for his age, and very mentally well. Wasn't suffering from Alzheimer's or dementia at all. He ate very clean, was a very well-known individual in the community he lived in. Many loved him and had nothing but good things to say. Until one day in early July, he went missing. Like the 21-year-old from the last story, he too went on a solo hike, like many outdoor enthusiasts nowadays do. After he had been reported missing for X amount of time, the search was called. This guy, we searched even farther, higher and lower, and found no traces. It's as if he had just vanished. But here, for this story, is where things take a weird twist. The dogs happened to catch his scent and led us to an area, not only completely off the trail, but in an area that didn't make any sense for him to be in. In an area where the brush and forest was incredibly dense and thick, making it near impossible for a 78-year-old man without heavy equipment to work through. Now, the dogs didn't get us through the woods. They led us to this area of woods, and then stopped and began whining. Well, now you're ready for the twist. I wasn't here on that search and rescue team for this segment of the story, but many of my close friends, who at the time were my colleagues, were. And this is the only time that I can ever think of that the search and rescue team was called off indefinitely for this man's case, as sad as that is. The report was that they were all nearly jumped and ambushed by a group of large, 10 to 12 feet, hairy wild men with spears and rocks, some of them throwing logs in the direction of my colleagues, while others began screaming, banging on trees, and making all sorts of ruckus. As a warning, you better leave this area now or you're going to die. Many of those same friends, when they recount this to me, you can see and tell the terror in their voices and faces having to relive this memory. Unfortunately for this older man, his scent trail led right into this area, where these things or wild men were, as everybody called them. I wish that when I signed up for this job, somebody could have had the decency to sit me down and explain to me that I was going to encounter things that would defy all rationale and explanation. That they could explain that I'm going to see things that don't make sense hear things, experience things, hear stories about things that aren't supposed to exist. Now, all I can do is share my experiences in hopes to educate those that are willing to listen. Story 2. The Underground Base Did some volunteer work for the forest service industry in Minnesota back in 2010 and 2011. I usually am one to try and stay out of government and military affairs, but I'm pretty sure, based on the things that I heard, there is a large military base or transfer center underneath a portion of the park that I worked at. Let me explain. Much of my time volunteering, I would spend it shadowing some of the other rangers, because for a while, it's what I was convinced I wanted to do. I remember there was one time I was doing rounds with a fellow ranger, and me, being in training, was still learning all the ropes, and this is the first of many times this happened, but I would hear this incredibly loud rumbling from underneath me. It was the equivalent to being maybe 20 or 30 feet above a New York subway, although in New York, I don't think you can hear the New York subway beneath you 
because the streets and the city life is so loud. But I'm trying to put your imagination there, to where it sounded like a train going underneath you. I know the thought of an underground train isn't all that exciting, but there were other sounds that I heard that resembled that and would make me think otherwise. I'm not saying that the sound I heard that was coming from underneath me was indeed a train. It was just this incredibly loud rumbling, like some sort of heavy machinery. Something was going on, and to my knowledge, there are no known military, government, or any other kind of buildings within miles of that area. Randomly, all throughout different days, I would hear everything, from loud machine humming, to banging, to other sorts of weird machinery sounds. There was a few times it sounded like I was hearing a stick of dynamite go off, far below my feet. I would even sometimes feel the ground shake very lightly. But the weird thing is, any time I would ever bring it up to one of the rangers, they would either ignore what I said and act like I didn't mention anything at all, or they would quickly change the subject being very careful not to acknowledge what I had said. I thought it was super weird. It was as if they knew something they couldn't mention anything about. Now, I don't know if this is some conspiracy among rangers, or if there's actually a military or government base underneath this area of the park, but it makes you wonder what really goes on in these parks when nobody else is around, when nobody else is listening, when people, the staff, the rangers, all know things that they're told to keep quiet on. None of this, now that I'm older and more aware of the things that truly go on in the world, none of these things surprise me anymore. And in fact, I'm now more confident than ever that there probably is something being hidden underneath that park. If you or somebody you know has a story or encounter they would like to share with me, please submit it to stories at whatlurksbeneath.com. You can find it in the description below. I'm going to keep my details and my identity pretty anonymous and vague, just for my own protection, in case, for whatever reason, the wrong person listens and hears this. I know I might be overly paranoid sounding, but you can never be too sure with sharing such sensitive information. Years back, for about seven months, I worked as a park ranger, as well as participating in some search and rescues. It wasn't all it was cracked up to be, and in fact, I experienced some very strange things that I feel it's important to talk about. The people whom I worked with I still have fairly good relationships with, at least most of them, even though this is well over 8-9 years ago. Before I get to anything, let me just say that before this job, I did not believe in the entire alien UFO phenomenon. I thought it was a huge hoax, just made up stuff to put on the internet for people's entertainment. But after my 7 months on the job, well, my opinion changed, and let me tell you why. We had at least four instances that I can recount on the top of my head. Probably more if I really try to sit down and think about it. Instances of people disappearing and reappearing for a considerable amount of time that did not make sense. The first being an older lady, roughly 68 or 67, fairly good shape, hiking by herself and just vanished. Vanished like there was no trace of her left. I do very vividly remember the search and rescue mission looking for her. The dogs would stop and start whining right on the spot that she disappeared. We could not find any trail scent. We could not find any trace of her belongings or clothes. She was heavily equipped. Backpack, camping equipment and all. And very survival smart. We found nothing. About six weeks go by. And she's there. Same trail as always coming back the direction she came from, acting strange when people were reacting to her, saying that she had only been gone for maybe an hour at most. Apparently, she had no idea that it was now roughly six weeks later, 
and was shocked when proven on the calendar and other sources of technology that proved to her that six weeks did indeed pass. So what happened? Did she just walk into another dimension and come back? It doesn't make any sense. I should also add that there was nothing wrong with her. No clothing marks, no dirt. She hadn't even aged. Of course, you're not going to age in six weeks, really. But you know what I mean. She looked exactly the same, clothing and all, as the day she disappeared. When she was taken into custody and interviewed, she said that she just hiked, went down the trail, and came back like nothing ever happened. The only major difference here is that on the day she disappeared, it was very, very sunny. And on the day she came back, there was considerable amounts of overcast. When asked about that, she simply stated that on her way back down the trail, a considerable amount of cloud coverage occurred, meaning overcast. Now, there's a lot of speculation around this story, specifically her. Some say she was abducted by aliens, as that's the only real thing that could explain the passing of time and her not changing any shape, form, and remaining perfectly intact, just as the day she was. Compare that to other similar phenomenons around other people going missing and turning up months later, sometimes years later, in exactly the same state they were when they disappeared. Also having absolutely no knowledge of them ever disappearing in the first place, or if it is, it's very vague, like they saw a white light, or something along those lines. This lady had no idea she was ever gone. The month she disappeared was early April to around mid-May. There was also speculation that she walked into a time portal somehow. Again, no real evidence to back that up. I thought the alien thing was a lot more plausible. And at the time, it really freaked me out, but still wasn't a nail in the coffin yet. And then it would happen again in June. Two small boys, actually, twins, four years old. I'll never forget these boys, named Jacob and Isaac, both wearing white shirts and blue coveralls. Very sweet little boys. They disappeared early June. Last seen, chasing or playing tag, running around in circles around a big fir tree. The next thing you know, they're gone. No trace of them. Same thing ensued. A large seven-day search and rescue mission found absolutely no trace of them. Parents, after about a month, were convinced they were dead, had a funeral service, they moved on with life as best they could. Then, right around Labor Day, I think it was about three days after, to be exact, so maybe September 14th, if my dates are correct, they appeared exactly the same state they were in, and you'll never get this, running around the same fir tree they were running around when they were last seen, still playing tag, still in the exact same clean white shirt and blue coveralls, same haircut, they hadn't missed a meal, they looked perfectly healthy and content, the same day as they left, like the previous woman and other accounts. They had no idea time had even passed, and at this point, it had easily been three months since their disappearance. Officials, police, and their parents, nobody could explain their disappearance, what happened or how it happened, but a similar situation where the parents took their eyes off their boys for just a moment to grab something while they were cooking, and boom, gone. This one also freaked us out. We got a chance to talk to the boys, me specifically. They had no idea anything ever happened. Their account, as the best of four-year-olds can give, is they were playing around a fir tree. Next thing you know, mom and dad have different clothes on, different haircuts, just basically a four-year-old's recounting of how mom and dad now look a little bit different because three months had passed and dad might have a little bit of a beard and mom's hair might be a little bit longer or shorter. You know, the best a four-year-old can describe. And like the lady before them, absolutely no trace of them going anywhere or having any sort of memory of where they were. Were they abducted and experimented on by aliens? I don't know. It's hard to say. But this one for me really sealed the deal. But then there would be two others. These two were also very strange. This next man, I won't mention his last name, but his first name was Martin. He was 38 years old. 
had apparently disappeared three years prior to this happening, and this would have been the beginning of October, suddenly reappeared in the same clothing and everything he had on the day he had disappeared. I believe he had disappeared about three and a half years earlier, although his account was a little bit different than the previous. He tells us, when he was eventually found and interviewed, that a bright light engulfed him, and for a while, he was wandering around in complete whiteness. Yes, he used the word whiteness, like a void of nothing but light and white, if that makes any sense although something of that description is really hard to even understand. He says during this time, he had no idea of any time passing. He also felt no feelings in his body, like hunger, sleep deprivation, thirst, bathroom, or any of that. He claims he has no idea how long he was there, but wondered aimlessly for what felt like months if not years. But in all actuality, said it was probably only five or ten minutes. He claims it was almost an out-of-body experience. The next thing you know, everything goes back down in light. He described the words as it dimming down, and then he was back here, in his body, in the same clothes he wore. He was not lying on the ground unconscious. In fact, he was still very much alert. He was surprised more than anybody else that three and a half years had fully passed, and it was now October, because when he disappeared, I believe it was March for him three years prior. Now, this very last one to me is by far the weirdest, and once I tell you, you'll understand why. So, we found this man about two weeks after Martin, and to be honest with you, if the two boys, Jacob and Isaac, hadn't sealed the deal, there's no way you could go through this case and not believe this man, his name was Brandon. He was 46 years of age. Kind of an older guy. But here's the thing. He had been gone for seven years. Disappeared without a trace. And when he was found again, in the middle of the park, just out of nowhere, he was in almost these white-like robes. Kind of like robes that a priest would wear at a temple. He had a very long beard but looked very upkept, very clean. When he was asked about who he was and his identification, he seemed to be fully aware and cognizant of everything around him, even how much time had passed, and that he knew he had been gone. But it gets much weirder than this. When he was interviewed and asked, he said he was at the park on a trail, where he was taken and also, like the other man, engulfed in a white light. He said it was there that he met beings, and according to his time frame, spent 10 years in what Brandon described just like Martin, as a place full of light and void. He said these beings that he mentored under, he specifically used the word mentor, taught him several languages, which he didn't know before. Here's the other weird thing. They taught him full-on Chinese. I mean, he could speak it extremely fluently. After speaking to his family to make sure he's not crazy, he was never able to speak it before. So, now this man of seven years now all of a sudden returns, wearing white priest-like robes, with a long beard, very upkept, and weirdly can speak very fluent Chinese, more than enough to actually live in that country. And on top of that, says he learned it and was taught it by these white translucent beings in this white void in which he was engulfed by a white light, and brought back the same way. Unlike Martin, he knew how much time had passed, and he knew he had been gone for X amount of time. But even though he was actually missing for seven years, he claims he was in this dimension for ten years. Now, I know what you're thinking, that this sounds absolutely insane, and I thought the same thing too. But when you get a chance to see this firsthand, to be on these search and rescue missions and to talk to these people, there's really no way to explain this thoroughly. I was feeling like I was living in an actual episode of the X-Files. I felt like I was in some sort of alternate universe. Nothing made sense. So the only thing I could really pinpoint is that there really must be alien life and for whatever reason is abducting people. I can't really explain why all four of these people 
had different experiences, two having very similar experiences, and the other two having very similar experiences. It doesn't really make sense to me, but I guess that doesn't matter in the long run. This kind of stuff happened, and shortly after Brandon had been found, I decided to quit. It was too much for me. I don't know how experienced park rangers or people in that service industry can handle it. I mean, it just goes beyond normalcy. With all of this said, do I really believe that UFOs or aliens had a hand in all of these things? Yes, I do. There's no other way to explain these weird abductions or lapses of time, or in Brandon's case, being taken, clothing being completely different, having a beard grown out, which, by the way, when he disappeared, was a clean-cut, clean-shaven guy, never knew a drop of Spanish or any other language besides English, and now apparently he comes back looking like a prophet of some religion, speaking full-blooded Chinese. Nothing really makes sense. And his story, if you ever actually got the chance to sit there and listen to his two-hour recount of it, was just incredibly strange. I was only given bits and pieces, major components of his tale, but that these strange translucent spiritual beings taught him multiple languages, which apparently don't exist anymore, and he would not speak them for fear of a reason I can't remember, but said they taught him full Chinese. You just think about how crazy that is, and how much it doesn't make sense. It scared the hell out of a lot of detectives and people working on that specific case, and many of us rangers it spooked us, because you clearly can't explain something like that. This was something truly supernatural, in every sense. Story 1. The Stairs one of the strangest things I have ever come across in my job as a ranger was a full staircase in the middle of the woods. There was nothing else around it to show that it was a part, or had been, of any original structure. No walls to suggest. There was once a house there, and there were far too many trees anyway. And finding that it wasn't an exclusive experience was even stranger. Apparently, coming across a staircase in the middle of nowhere that has no purpose wasn't an unusual occurrence, but it didn't make the experience any less weird and creepy. I stood and stared for a long time. The other thing that made the whole thing even more unnerving was just how quiet it was. If finding a set of stone steps, and yes, they looked like something straight out of Game of Thrones, which wasn't odd enough. I would have imagined there would have been signs of life. Birds on the stone, bugs, even moss growing. But there was nothing. Nothing at all. I couldn't resist climbing them myself. Even though they were fairly high and unsteady, I couldn't help myself. And of course, that was when I came across the most disturbing thing of all, because until now, the stairs had been an oddity, a curiosity. But now, they became something from a nightmare, because at the very top, on the very last step, was blood. Now, I will add why I was out in the very remote part of the forest. We were helping to look for a missing woman, Search and rescue, and the police were doing bulk of the job. But since it was a vast area, and they needed all hands on deck, we all were in. Although she was never found. After I got back to the base and reported no sign of her, but told the team leader about the stairs, the first thing I was asked was, did you climb them? When I replied yes, she told me, to never, ever do that again. And also informed me that now, the missing woman would never be found. When I tried to ask her how any of this was connected, she shooed me out of the office and told me to not mention what I did to anybody. And if I did, I would be risking our lives. And that was the end of that. 
Story 2. Pile of Bones I was out with one of the dogs one day, in one of the very remote parts of the park that I work in as a ranger. There are literally hundreds of miles of forest, and we were about as far in as you could get. Surrounding the edge of the trees, wherever we were, were mountains, some of them with vertical drops that made them look almost man-made. Before you get to the full-size mountains, there were some much smaller mounts of rocks. I say smaller, and they were still the size of a three- or four-story building, but smaller in comparison to the size of the main ones. And again, several of these had entirely vertical frontage and were almost completely smooth, too. This meant even an extremely sure-footed creature would not be able to shimmy up there, unless they were maybe Spider-Man. And yet, whenever we went over that way, the dogs would always go nuts. Ranger canines are also often trained as search animals, and have a very keen sense of smell and aptitude for knowing when something is amiss. They would always, without fail, give the indication that there was something on top of those smaller structures, despite it being almost entirely impossible. One day, the local search and rescue team was needing some practice, and they had the chopper out. Since we are good buddies with the guys, I mentioned this particular spot that the dogs always go mad over. We all had a good chuckle about it, and they decided to land the chopper there as if nothing else. It was a good place, as any, to do a dummy rescue. I asked if I could come along, just to intrigue my curiosity. And do you know what we found? Bones. Nothing else but several piles of human bones. Not full skeletons either, but at least four different bodies worth. Three adults, one child. Three male, one female, all varying in how long they'd been there, from what the medical examiner could tell. There was no way on or off that ledge. No signs of anything else having ever been there. We never did find an explanation for that one. Story 3. Dakota Miller's Disappearance Hi, what lurks beneath. I used to work, myself, in the forest industry service, and I have my own very disturbing 411-styled story. The person who went missing in this little story was a little seven-year-old boy who went by the name of Dakota Miller. You could probably look him up, but I don't know if you'll find anything, as before I wrote this up to you, I looked and couldn't find anything. I'm not sure why that is. But anyway, back in the late 90s, Dakota was a regular little boy who had a loving mom and dad. Apparently what happened, it was said that the family went camping for a week, I believe, south of St. Louis, when the mom and dad had their back turned for just a moment, as many of these 411 cases seem to go. And just like that, the little boy had vanished. It was summertime, so he was seen wearing a dark blue shirt and red shorts and sneakers. They were at the campsite when the boy disappeared. There were no other campers nearby. No possible way he could just vanish like that. The nearest trees were easily 40 to 50 feet away. They were perfectly in the clear. It was as if he had just vanished, evaporated, like he was a vapor in the air. Search and rescue went on for well over 10 days in search of this little boy, when six days, about 200 miles away, they found the exact same pair of sneakers, shorts, and shirt that he had been wearing the day of his disappearance. Only due to the terrain and distance of the finding, they weren't sure if these clothing correlated to the boy after some research and DNA matching, it turned to be that these were the exact same sneakers, 
shorts, and t-shirt of Dakota, who went missing only six days prior to being found, at least his clothes. There was no underwear in his clothing. There was also no dirt marks, no scuffs. His clothes were just as clean and as neat as the day he had disappeared. His clothes were randomly found by an older gentleman who was out hiking that day along the upper northern section of Arkansas. Dakota's body and his remains were never discovered. But like any 411 story, the most disturbing thing is how did he go from alive to disappearing so quick? And how? Where are his remains? What happened to him? And now, nearly 20 years later, after trying to look into it more, there is still nothing. It was inconclusive. And after, I believe, the 12th day of search and rescue, they called it off, with the only findings they had were his clothing. That was it. As far as we know, the world, he's just gone. Story 4. Lycanthropy and the Cover-Up I haven't really heard anybody else on your show say this, so I'll say it for them. If you are wanting a quiet and laid-back job, don't become a park ranger. Being a park ranger doesn't put you at the back of the world where you'll be safe and unharmed. No. Being a ranger puts you at the forefront of the line. Marines, National Guard, SEALs. Give me one of those guys for six weeks, and I guarantee you, they'll be crapping their pants in ways they never did during basic. Look, the job puts you right at the contact point between the edge of humanity and the edge of darkness. As a park ranger, you are the unwitting crosswalk guard because there are always people trying to plunge into the darkness. And there are always things in the darkness trying to break through into the domain of man. Now with that little rant out of the way, here's my personal story. Rumors of wild animal attacks in the park began to pile up. People would come out of the park with bite marks, slash wounds that were made by something from the animal kingdom. But a few of the victims reported that the assailant was a man. A couple even went on to say that it was a full-on lycanthropy. The delusion held by a person that they are a wolf or a werewolf. I didn't exactly sign on to take down nut jobs, but myself and my fellow rangers were briefed on what to do if we ever ran into the predator at large, and what we would do if it was an animal, and what we would do if it was a human being. And thus, we were expected to be more alert and vigilant and proactive than we were to begin with. I was out on patrol when I was sure that I saw movement in the trees. It looked unusual. I prayed that it wasn't a predator. I wasn't afraid. I just didn't want to tangle with anything. I readied my service firearm, got out of the car, and called out in the direction of the movement. There was a response. I was met with the face of a man with hair so long that he would probably step on it if he wasn't careful. His eyes were wide open, to the point they were perfectly round oves. He tilted his head at me in a mocking sneer. His teeth were yellow and pink, and I'm pretty sure that he was completely naked. So, it was a safe bet that he was a nutcase. But I did mind the protocol and behaved as if he could understand me. I called to him to stand down and stop for a chat. He was waiting for me in a clearing. That beard of his was swaying like brown vines, hanging from an ancient swamp tree. Madness rang out like an emergency siren from his eyes. There was no way that he 
was a rational human being. I trained my firearm on him, and again, attempted to talk him down. That's when he projectile vomited something foul and bloody onto me. Stunned with disgust, not only was it obvious that he had spewed blood on me, the contents of his stomach was a whole collection of small fingers, way too tiny to be that of an adult, and the sheer number suggested that he had fed on multiple children. I almost felt that he had engorged himself just for the occasion. As a parent and a new grandparent, the situation had just taken a very personal turn. I gave chase, and this maniac howled long and high. It's not possible to explain just how fast he was. I would be close to catching up, as to get a clear shot, and then he was darting ahead, out of range. I began to feel that I was being toyed with. The madness of the whole thing turned just plain evil, when the pursuit took me out onto one of the playgrounds where plenty of kids were present. Like lightning, the nude, grinning monster had grabbed up a tiny girl by the hair, scrawny as a newborn deer, and sunken his teeth into one of her eyes and bitten it out. When I fired, he had already flung her up in the line of fire, and just like that, she was a one-eyed human shield. Her body knocked me back as she hit me square in the face. When I was regaining myself, the monster was already lunging at yet another child. I was able to react in a fraction of the time, only thanks to the adrenaline tearing through my system. Skull fragments flew, and his outstretched fingers went limp before he could wrap them around a boy's small neck. I don't think I've ever fought so hard to keep consciousness. My body was trying to black out, probably to cushion me from the knowledge that I just shot a child the instant after she had been mutilated by a crazed monster. That's when the thought hit me. Was she even dead? I was beginning to see double. I found her face down in the grass. Her hysterical parents were running to her, turning her over, looking at her eye socket. This might be the most frightening part of all. Somewhere inside of me came the urge to shoot it. She was ruined. She would be scarred. And it was all because I was half a second too slow. One shot ruined. It was almost like I was hearing the thought out loud, like it was being put into my brain. But my brain had finally snapped, and I blacked out. I'm not too sure the outcome of everything. Once I regained consciousness, the police were on all this pretty quickly. I resigned after being blackmailed, and I can't give too much details about that. But I know SUVs and men in suits were quick at the scene. It's probably no surprise that none of this made it to the news or any news outlets online. And as far as I know, they took that little girl, who by the way was still alive, into custody on their end. Again, I don't know whatever happened, but I don't work in that job field anymore. Story 5. The Mysterious Black Bear The park I work in also has a large camping area. Sometimes, we act more like security trying to keep people from going into the restricted areas of the woods and parkland after dark. These areas are out of bounds for very good and often uninteresting reasons. Sometimes there may be rare birds' nests that we don't want disturbed, or there's been some torrential rain which has made a certain area treacherous. But people sometimes like to think they know better one important thing about the park I work at is there are no bears. No bears at all in the entire area. 
not been a bear sighting here for decades, actually. So, when we got a report from a little girl about seeing a really, really large black bear, we were pretty confused, and also thought the girl must be too. I had a good search in the area anyway, just to please the child, and was stunned to find that there were very clearly bear claw scratches on trees where the child had reportedly seen the animal. There was no other evidence, and we searched thoroughly through the whole park for any other signs, but nothing. We still have no idea how it would be even possible for a huge bear to appear out of nowhere when there hadn't even been a single bear sighting in the entire county for nearly 70 years. And, even more, how only one small girl could see it, then it just disappears again. If it had been for the fresh scratches, we would have thought that it was a prank by one of our own animal experts, even though they were adamant that it was legitimate. We will never know for certain exactly what happened and how it was even possible. There was talk about it being a ghost of a bear, but that's not something I tend to believe in. However, I really couldn't think of any other possible explanation. Story 6. Not Always Human My patrol had become so sleepy that I began taking the liberty of spending the earliest part of it walking one of the shorter trails. It's technically not a bad thing to do. It just meant that I wouldn't be able to speed off to respond to any incidents right away. But, I was coming up on week six without any kind of alert. So, I began to relax my approach to things. And yes, Murphy's Law has a way of singling people like me out. I was at the point on the trail that was the furthest from my car when I had heard a horrible shrieking that shattered the silence of the forest. I was torn between sprinting back to my car and just running to where the screaming seemed to be coming from. But when you're surrounded by trees like that, it's pretty impossible to gauge just how far away any sound is. I opted for doing the whole thing on foot, promising myself that I'd never leave my car behind again. The screaming continued, and I seemed to be zeroing in on it. But when I thought I was going to come up on a source, it would suddenly be another 15 seconds of running away. I wondered if I was having hearing issues, or if the acoustics of the forest were just so unfortunately arranged that that screwed with my perceptions badly. But it kept happening. My urgency began to melt into suspicion. I did the worst thing that any park ranger could do in a situation like that, and I stopped chasing. Instead, I began creeping. I crept up through the tall grasses ducking behind trees, trying to get as close to the noise as I could before whatever it was could give me the slip again. It worked. Peering out from behind my tree, I saw something that was only vaguely human. From its head to its neck to its shoulders was a stretched membrane of skin that almost made it look like a nun's headwear. Except... It was skin. The whole thing was nude and seemed to be of the female persuasion. Its chest was flat and long and pendulous. The eyes were gaping and yellowed. The mouth was something else and it stretched open almost like it was distended, unhinged like a snake's jaw. And the unnaturally yawning cavity bellowed another plaintive cry of distress. The polarity of everything changed in that very moment. I was being deceived, but deceived into what I didn't know. I put one hand on my pistol, just to be safe, and I began to back away from the direction I was heading. 
the creature or whatever swayed as if anxious and it let out another longer louder cry i just kept backing up this caused the creature to scream again but not in distress it was the howl of an enraged predator deprived of a meal it rocketed toward me propelling itself through its strides with its knuckles like that of a gorilla in the time that it took me to bring my pistol up to an aiming position the creature was close enough for me to spit on luck was on my side at the last possible second my shot landed right between the eyes of it and it face planted hard into the ground here's the part that might get rejected from being read i got ready to radio out and tell the office what i just experienced but the body of the creature slowly crumbled into a pile of white pulsating embers that cooled off into gray ashes i poked at the pile for bones or anything but there was nothing left i quickly told the main office that there was nothing wrong and when they questioned me i just told them off i quickly dismissed anything and told them i didn't feel well and then shortly afterwards i quit that job entirely story seven real life wood wampas years ago back when i was living up in the state of maine for a few years i loved to go explore the outdoors in fact i made it a thing during the spring and summer to go and try and hike as many trails as i could most of it was to just motivate me to get in shape and stay in shape having dealt with extremely toxic eating habits and a lot of weight gain i figured the best thing for me was to be out in nature hiking losing weight after all i hated running jogging working out but i loved the woods and walking almost feels like you're not doing anything and it's easily one of the best and easiest exercises to pull off i would usually start walking anywhere between three to five miles a day i had no problems with it i loved it so in hindsight it's the reason why i lost so much weight but on this particular day in july would stop my progression for at least a month because whatever i saw scared the living terror out of me i get there to the trailhead and i'm getting out of my car when i notice i'm the only one in the parking lot even though it was a very small parking lot but still it was a beautiful day in late july and the only other vehicle I could see was a ranger's vehicle who drove up to me quickly as I was getting my own backpack out the back seat. He called me over and wanted to speak to me, ask what I was doing. I told him I was working on endurance walking, going up the trail, and this one was about a five mile loop, which I told him was perfect. He informed me and his behavior was very disturbing that i should try and find a different trailhead in a different area and said there's been some possible animal sightings that were unknown and could pose a threat i looked at him strangely and asked him do you mean like wolves or bears and i'll never forget him looking away looking down and just saying no not quite and just kept referring back to that it's probably not the best idea i choose to hike this path that it could potentially be dangerous he was acting really weird avoiding specific answers and wouldn't answer my questions i thought the dude was weird afterwards he ended the conversation drove off and wished me luck i was thinking whatever dude so i walked off and did my thing i get about four miles down the trail probably about near an hour in i was a pretty fast walker like i said i was probably a little over an hour into my trail when i come around a bend in the small trail and directly ahead of me coming right out of the trees were two 
extremely large, brown-shaped humanoid things walking right towards me at a slow pace. My first thought, actually, get this, when I saw these two things, and forgive me because I can't remember their names, but in Star Wars, you have these white yeti-looking things, the same creature that I believe Luke kills in Episode 5, but forgive me if I'm wrong. They reminded me of that. Big huge hands, humanoid, except they were brown, but they kind of had that same walk, slow and menacing. I immediately turned back around and started running as fast as I could, thinking to myself, if these are Bigfoot, I'm most certainly dead. I'm not sure if it was my endurance at the time or pure terror taking over me, but I ran the extra four miles back to the parking lot in probably half the time that it took me up the trail. Also, I contribute that to the fact that it was mostly downhill, so maybe 20 to 30 minutes. The things, well, I don't know if they ever followed me. I never turned around to check, but either way, it scared the lights out of me. Did I get a real good look at them? No. I saw enough to know that it was no bueno. Nine foot tall, hairy wood-looking ape beast humanoid things. Scary, scary, scary. I never did go back to that trailhead again after that, and hiked in completely different areas. A few years later, I moved out of the state, down to Florida, where I still am today. Still, I've gone through some crazy stuff in my life, and nothing at all compares to the terror I felt in that moment and on that day. Now maybe I understand why that park ranger was acting so strange. He must have known something. Why he didn't tell me, I'll never know. Story 8. The Scream I was out in the truck once when something really weird happened. I'm a park ranger out in Maine, and if you know that state at all, it is huge and can be quite eerie in certain places. There are tons of animals out here, and one of the most dangerous that I have ever come across are actually moose. They can be very dangerous, but I felt perfectly safe in my vehicle. That was when I heard the screaming. I used to work in California, and I would hear the sound often enough. It sounded like a woman dying, as if she was being violently attacked or murdered. But it was in fact a mountain lion, which, after all, was no less scary to happen upon. But there are not any cougars in Maine, so this really was a woman screaming. I called it in, as there should not have been anybody this far out, except rangers, and I knew there weren't any female staff out and about that day. I then continued to drive around to see if I could find her, and at this point, I was still sure it was a her and that she was in trouble. I mean, why would you think anything else? I heard that high-pitched, very female scream about four more times before I came across to an area that I had never been to before. Not even in my vehicle. There are quite a lot of caves and caverns in this part of the park too. Again, I radioed my colleagues, said to come join me. A couple arrived and we got out and began looking around, specifically the cave openings. We couldn't see or hear anything now and most of them had rocks or plants growing up around the mouths of the cave. So it would be obvious if somebody had been in or out the way where they would be disturbed. All of a sudden, one of the newer rangers, a rookie, shouted that he had seen something up in one of the larger trees. We quickly ascertained that there was nobody up there, but the thing that the kid had seen was pretty weird. It was a purse, a rather large lady's purse. It was empty, but we couldn't think of a single way that it could have gotten that high up 
and so far into the branches. We kept searching, but never found anything. There were no women reported missing. No purses reported missing. It was just another mystery to add to the ever-growing list of weird stuff that happens out in the woods. Story 9. Ghosts of the Past Not far from the park where I served as a ranger was a barred-off property surrounded by thick timber that served as training grounds for police. It looked like a really elaborate treehouse for gun-loving kids, but no. It was very much for adults, and it was for anything but playing. Elevated land surrounded the setup on all sides, so that there was no chance of a stray bullet harming anybody outside the training ground. Rangers see far less firefights than police do, but most of us do carry a gun, so it came as no surprise that it was decided that myself and my fellow rangers would spend a few hours a day for a week brushing up on our marksmanship. My time slot was taken care of by an officer, we'll call Colette. I was puzzled at the fact that it was just me and her, because I knew that I had seen the others being trained as a group but you eventually stop trying to make sense of the decisions of your superiors. You know, just like at any other job. Colette was a very admirable instructor. She was patient when she found out that I had the precision of a shotgun. She wasn't much for small talk, but she wasn't a stuffed shirt either. She was just there to do her job and do it politely. As the days passed, I thought my eyes were beginning to play tricks on me. I thought I noticed these deep, dark welts on Colette that hadn't been there the day before. She insisted that they had always been there, but I wasn't so sure. I tried to rationalize it away as a simple matter of her forgetting to put makeup on, but they were awful to look at. Some of them looked like sunken in wounds. Then there was this awful smell attached to her. And I'm not talking about discrepancy in hygiene. This was the gagging stench of straight-up rot and death, minus her injuries. She looked as clean as ever. It made no sense that she would smell any kind of way. I kept trying to find a way to bring it up before I would end up vomiting in front of her. But I just couldn't. The last day of training, everyone would be trained together. All groups, all instructors. Colette was the last one to show up, and she had turned an awful color since the day before. One of the other park rangers was now visibly shaken to the point that he was turning colors himself. Colette acted like she was seeing a long-lost friend when she caught sight of him, and she moved in for a friendly hug. But he recoiled in disgust. Colette shrugged, and she shook me by the hand, and led me off to a far corner of the training ground where trees grew very dense together. She told me that she enjoyed her time with me, and that she knew she could trust me with what she was going to show me next. My fellow ranger from earlier raced over to us and was absolutely out of his mind, stammering and trying to shoo me away from whatever it was that Colette was going to do. I was confused. I told him to shut up, and I'd be with him in a moment. This made him worse. He seemed to be getting desperate. He aimed his pistol right at me. He was the portrait of a man who had become completely unglued. Yet another ranger had followed us, suspicious of the other's dramatic behavior. Dramatic ranger took a round to the thigh from suspicious ranger, causing him to drop his pistol. I was grateful and took the piece before Dramatic Ranger could get it back. 
Colette had me move some medium-sized rocks from a depression in the earth. I wasn't surprised to find what I found. There were bones, complete with tattered clothing and a badge that had Colette's name on it. There was a second badge, one that must have ended up there on accident. It belonged to Dramatic Ranger. I looked up at Colette, who was smiling at me, looking both sad and pleased with herself, and then she vanished. Suspicious Ranger denied seeing Colette at any given time. I grilled him over it, asking him who had just been taking me out to training all week. He figured I just prefer to train by myself and thought I was just kind of a bamf for it. The body indeed turned out to be Colette's, and Dramatic Ranger confessed to be the murderer from a few years back. Others remarked at how he had lost his badge, like he had a way of losing everything else, so it didn't stand out as something unusual for him. He went to prison, which left me, the only other person that had actually seen Colette. My drinking habit got a little worse after that. I never was the supernatural or superstitious type, and there was honestly no way to explain what I had just experienced for an entire week in materialistic terms. So, here, have a story. Nobody, which I understand can confirm or deny the events but me, but it's hands down the most terrifying realistic experience I've ever had with an actual ghost of somebody once living. I never did believe, but now I firmly do. Story 10. The Faceless One of the most frightening things that I have ever experienced was on a nighttime shift as a park ranger. Now, to be clear with you, I work in the UK. We do not have many predators like bears, wolves, pumas, etc. The scariest creatures I have come across are vixens who are in season. They scream like they are being attacked, as they also do when mating, and a badger who appeared out of nowhere and scared the life out of me, as he very obviously hadn't missed a meal in quite some time. But, shrieking foxes and fat badgers are par of the course. They might give you a shock when you're out and about, but they won't follow you home and haunt your dreams. That particular attribute is saved for the faceless man, and I'm not the only ranger to have seen him. My own experience came one night when I was out on the moor, just making a routine patrol of the entire area. We don't tend to get many waifs and strays up here. Too cold. Sometimes we do get notified to keep an eye out for the odd runaway, but 99 times out of 100, we never see a thing. It was a particularly bleak night, cold, wet, and I was dying to get back to the office for a much needed cup of tea. And that moment, of course, was when I saw somebody run past the van. That sight alone was enough to shock me as I rammed on the brake to make sure I didn't hit him. He didn't even seem to notice me. He just kept running alongside the road. At this point, I didn't think anything supernatural was happening. It was just some bloke out running, although that alone wasn't a good sign in this weather, and there was no way you should be on the moor in the dark. So I started up the van, and I followed. It only struck me afterwards that I, in a vehicle, should have easily caught up with him and overtaken a person on foot. But this chap was really fast. When I eventually caught up to him, after a few moments, I pulled alongside and must have been doing around 40 miles an hour 
just keeping pace. I rolled down my window and called over to him, asking if he was okay, suggesting I give him a lift home. Then he turns and looks at me. Well, I presume he was looking at me. You see, he had no eyes or face. It was just a blur. The man himself seemed corporeal. He wasn't transparent or anything, like I would have presumed a ghost would be. Everything about his body looked real and solid. He just didn't have a face. Just a head, with a fuzzy, blurry pixelation instead of facial features. It was a good job that the road over the moor was totally straight and I had nothing to crash into, as right then, I was so freaked out that I would have hit something for certain. He seemed to speed up even faster and then turned off the road and zoomed off down the moor. I'm not embarrassed to say that I was terrified right then and raced back to the office as fast as I can manage. I'll never forget walking through the door and the supervisor taking one look at me and switching the kettle on. I guess you saw the no-face runner then, she had said. It seemed that most of the team had come across him at one time or another. He never tried anything. Didn't appear to be an omen or anything, but you can never catch him. If you tried to drive or run after him, he would disappear. Most sightings of things like this have some sort of legend attached, so you at least can make a guess as to who the person is, was, and why they're there. I mean, it would have made sense if there had been some sort of hit-and-run accident, and there had been the man killed. But if that was the case, it had never been reported, which in its own right was highly unusual. We never had any reports from members of the public either. It only seemed to be us, the members, us rangers, who got to see him. Very mysterious indeed. Story 11. Suicide Ritual It had been hitting the news around our parts that various landmarks had been disappearing from the tourist route that ran through our corner of Texas. The thieves had targeted nothing but old-time fast food joints that had those oversized cartoonish fiberglass sculptures as part of the storefront. Hot dogs with jolly faces and arms and legs. Pigs that looked like Porky wearing chef hats and aprons. Stuff like that. Things from a time when America was really America. Well... These things are getting lifted, and the crooks were getting away with it so far. As a park ranger, somebody who thoroughly serves in the forest industry, it would be a stretch for me to make a connection between any of those disappearing sculptures and my day job. I forgot about those reports almost as soon as I had heard about them. While on patrol on one of the trails, my vehicle was suddenly under fire. Bullet holes were punched into the hood. The windshield was spiderwebbed. I threw the car into park and ducked down, radioing out for help and got a confirmation. I thought about the gas tank, which had just been filled up, so it was going to be a bad idea to sit in the car. A few more holes punched into the passenger side, so I took the chance of getting out of the car on the driver's side. Back up, arrived and long story short, we nailed the shooters without much trouble. I kind of figured they had been on a suicide mission of some sort and just wanted to go out with a bang. I turned one body over and looked into the face of a man who had painted his face something like a cartoon rabbit the sort of thing kids would do at a carnival. Except this was a 30-plus-year-old man. 
The other shooter was painted to look like a smiling pig. Looking around the pocket of timber that they had been shooting from, we found the missing fiberglass sculptures reported about in the news. They were dressed up in hoodies and jackets and bathrobes and arranged in a large circle around the mutilated body of a beautiful young woman. At the feet of each sculpture were alternating red and black candles. It turned out the woman had been beaten, raped, and mutilated. The blood was found inside a repurposed bleach bottle. Some of it had been poured on each sculpture, staining their improvised clothes. The sculptures were tediously identified and hauled off to be held until the rightful owners could get them. At the time, I didn't think there would be any more to the story. And I hate to say it, but grisly things like that add to this place's popularity. And our section of the state was kind of hurting for tourism and commerce. I know, it sounds incredibly cold. I am divorced, if that says anything. So, each sculpture ended up in the right place, and it was celebrated in the news. Not long after, it was reported that the restaurant owners were throwing the previously stolen sculptures away, some of them even being burned. Only a couple of the owners were even willing to give a statement, and they were vague about it at best. They said something along the lines of it, of it not feeling right, or they must have been cursed. Strange things have happened since sculptures came back, none of them being good for business, despite the spike in traffic because of notoriety. The stories that weren't revealed in the news were whispered throughout the community in the years to come. It certainly was one of the strangest experiences of mine on the job, and really one of my only hand-to-hand -hand experiences with the occult. Story 12 the Great Search One of the worst times to be a ranger is in the winter, especially if your area is up in the mountains. We do our god best to tell people to stay away. Snow is dangerous, especially if you don't know what you're doing. Not just avalanches and heavy drifts, but there are all sorts of other dangers like tree wells, and things that appear solid but are apt to give away and have you plunge to a very painful death. Of course, we still have to go out and about and check the terrain and on any animals out there too. Most, of course, which are hibernating, but it is still a part of the job to make sure they are safe too. And that was when we got a call to say that a family dad, mom, and two little girls had gone up the mountain and not come back. Neighbors had called the cops after they had been missing for a couple of days. The dad had asked the neighbor to let the dog out, but assured her they would be home in time for dinner. When they weren't, she did not panic right away, but when they weren't back for the following day's dinner, she called the cops who alerted us and sent out search parties. We found the parents almost straight away, at the bottom of a ravine, both crumpled and bloodied, and, well, very dead. No sign of either children. The weather was horrendous. Snow still coming in strong, and it was making it next to impossible to look for tracks. We searched all the caves and caverns in the area, anywhere they may have crawled into for shelter. But nothing. After another two days of relentless snow and futile searching, we gave up. Even if they were there, they were most likely frozen, died due to exposure. As awful as it sounds, we resigned ourselves to the fact that they would likely turn up when the snow began to thaw. Well, a few days later, 
we did find one. Completely by chance, when we'd been out to check on one of the caves where we knew there was a young family of bears, although in the same park. This particular cave was roughly 20 miles from the spot where the parents' bodies had been found. It would have been almost impossible for a small four-year-old child to get through the snow and make it over that way. And yet, there she was. Not a mark on her. Thankfully, the smell of her had not woken the bears. She was, of course, dead, but appeared completely frozen, not injured. During the autopsy report, it was discovered that fish and berries were in her stomach, which had been consumed just a few hours before her dying. As for the other child, she was never found. She simply vanished into the snow and, well, never returned. There was another full-scale search for the body after the thaw began. They even searched for bones in and around the caves in case she'd been dragged off and eaten. All that was ever found was one of her snow boots and one glove, both of them miles apart from each other. The boot just in the middle of a path and went and led nowhere, and one glove at almost the very top of a fir tree. There was no trace of blood or any other evidence on either. It remains an open case to this day. This happened almost five years ago. But even now, when I'm out on one of my patrols, I always keep a lookout for her or any other part of her or her clothing. She is by far not the only person that goes missing. Not by a long shot. Something happened to these people. Something or someone takes them or they're experiencing something we will never have an answer for. Is there some sort of monster out there? Do parks act as some kind of beacon to UFOs? I don't think we will ever know for sure, but I'm 100% certain that somebody knows what's going on. If you or someone you know has a story or encounter they would like to share with me, please, Send it to stories at wetlurksbeneath.com.